Buenos dias and uh, welcome to the Nobel Le Laureate Lecture during this annual research conference at Tech de Monterrey 2022. Every year, Tech has a research conference uh, at this time of the year. And since uh, 2020, for three years, there has been a developed tradition that the Nobel Prize winner gives an inspirational presentation at the conference. Previous uh, Nobel presentations have been given by Ada Yonat in 2020 and Aaron Chichanover 2021, both coming from Israel and both winners of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Last year and also this year, their presentations has to occur via video due to the pandemic travel restrictions. This year's speaker is Professor Michael Jung from the Rockefeller University in New York, who was awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Medicine. We are, of course, very happy that he has agreed to address us here at Tech de Monterey today. I will come back to him in just a few moments, but first some backgrounds. First, I am Bertil Andersson, a Swedish professor of biochemistry, but I now live in Israel. I have for several years also worked in Singapore, where I was the president of Nanyang Technological University. But my most important task today, however, is that I'm a distinguished visiting professor at Tech de Monterey and also a senior advisor to the leadership of the university. I spend about two months every year at Tech, and I think that has a great ambition to become a top level research intensive university and its education is already world-class. Also, to take my relation to Mexico complete, I must also mention that my, 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 my wife is from Mexico. I previously, for many years, have been involved with the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm and also been in the Nobel Committee for Chemistry, selecting Nobel Prize laureate. The Nobel Prize, as you probably already know, is the most prestigious prize in the world. It is given each year in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and also a special prize in economics. It has been awarded since 1901 in a grand ceremony in Stockholm each year on the 10th of December. The prize is awarded based upon a big donation by Alfred Nobel, who was a Swedish industrialist and the inventor of dynamite. I can here also mention that there has been three Mexican Octavio Paz Literature Prize in 1990 and Mario Molina Chemistry Prize in 1995. So now back to this year's Nobel Prize speaker here at Tech, Michael Young. He was awarded the Nobel Prize, as I mentioned, in Medicine 2017 for his discoveries concerning the molecular mechanism controlling the circadian rhythm. He shared the prize with two American scientists. The circadian rhythm is about the clock in our bodies. We get tired in the evening and we go to sleep and we are typically hungry around midday and we have our lunch. If you, for example, fly from Mexico to Europe, you often get jet lagged, and um, this is because and you get tired at strange hours of the day, and that's because your biological clock still thinks you're in Mexico, although you now have flown to to London. Some people have non-functional biological clocks and can, for example, se severely suffer from sleeping disorder. So Michael Young, through his research, discovered the molecular nature of our biological clocks and the mechanism, how they work. You will hear more from Professor Young in just a few moments. So let me finally just give some further background. Michael Young was born and raised in Miami, Florida. His family moved to Texas and he made his undergraduate and graduate studies at University of Texas at Austin, actually not so far from Mexico and Monterey. He received uh, his PhD at Austin in 1975. He then continued his research as the postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, 
1975 to 1977. In 1978, he joined Rockefeller University in, in New York as an assistant professor. And he has stayed there all the time since then, in otherwise for 44 years. He was made full professor in 1988, and he has, among other things, served as vice president for academic affairs at Rockefeller. He lives most of his time in New York, but he also has a house in New Mexico. So I'm sure when the pandemic is over, we can convince him to come to Tech de Monterey for a real on-site visit. Thank you for your attention. I have now come to the end of my introduction. And it's time to turn to Michael Young and listen to his talk. We are all looking forward. Thank you very much. Michael W. Young, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Richard and Jean Fisher Professor, Head of the Laboratory of Genetics in the Rockefeller University BA in Biology, 1971, PhD in Genetics, 1975, University of Texas, Austin. Doctoral work with Bert Judd, Cytogenetic Studies of Drosophila Chromosomes. Postdoctoral work, Biochemistry, Stanford University Medical School with David Harkness. Identification and cloning of Drosophila transposable elements. Joined the faculty of the Rockefeller University in 1978. Fellow of the Andre and Bella Mayer Foundation. Work at the Rockefeller has focused on two areas of research. Neuromuscular development, stemming from the laboratory's isolation and studies of the notch locus of Drosophila, and the genetics of behavior, primarily circadian rhythms, including initial cloning of the period gene of Drosophila. Discovery and functional characterizations of the circadian clock genes timeless. Double time, shaggy, real, and PDP-1, and modeling of principal molecular features of the Drosophila circadian system. He has held different positions at Rockefeller University, among others. Also, he has been an honorary member of different committees, such as the New York Academy of Sciences and the Physiological Society London. He has published more than 90 research articles in different platforms like PubMed and NCBI, Recent honors and awards. Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2017. Member of American Philosophical Society in 2018. President's Council of New York Academy of Sciences in 2018. Please welcome Dr. Michael W. Young. Hello. Hello. Wonderful, Wonderful to be here, uh, even virtually. I have to say that I'd much rather be in Monterey than in New York today. It's uh, still quite uh, cold, as you heard in the introduction. I grew up in South Florida, so I feel much more at home, I think, in Monterey than, uh, than up here in New York in the winter. But it is uh, uh, great to be with you virtually. Perhaps in the future, I'll have a chance to be there with you face to face. What I'd like to uh, talk about today are uh, studies that we've uh, been performing uh, using Drosophila. Uh, you'll recall that Drosophila is uh, where we've uh, focused our efforts now for many years, uh, hoping to gain insights that have general relevance to uh, animal biology. Uh, that's certainly been the case with circadian uh, biology, the genes and proteins uh, we identified in the, in the fly are uh, essentially the same as those that uh, run our human clocks. Uh, but today, I, uh, I won't be talking about circadian rhythms. I will be talking about sleep. Uh, and again, using Drosophila to ask questions about the impact of social isolation, which I think uh, all of us have had a good dose of over the past uh, two years. Uh, impact on the brain and behavior uh, using Drosophila as a model that allows us to explore this area. So let me begin by uh, referring to a, uh, a study that was uh, performed in the uh, 
my university college London um, over a period of a year beginning in March of 2020 and extending for one year to March of 2021. And the idea behind this study is that a cohort of about 70,000 United Kingdom respondents were asked to, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, report their sleep quality. And uh, the highest level of uh, sleep quantity in this questionnaire would have been a five. And what's being plotted here is a fraction of individuals of that 70,000 uh, cohort that uh, reported that highest levels of very good sleep quality. And uh, what you see is that at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the study, about 15% of the respondents uh, reported that they had very good uh, uh, sleep quality. That's for males. Uh, females were not so happy with their uh, sleep quality. Uh, about 10% said judged that their sleep quality was very good. But you see that both males and females over the course of, the, of that year showed a slow erosion of their impressions of their sleep quality. And of course, when interviewed about uh, why it was changing, uh, uh, most respondents were uh, quick to say that uh, they simply couldn't, uh, their quality was eroding, they weren't able to get the sleep that they wanted. Uh, this, of course, is a time period during which there were many uh, lockdowns in the United Kingdom. And it raises the question, of course, as to the, uh, uh, the changing aspects of society that, uh, of environment that uh, could be responsible for these changes in uh, sleep quality that were being perceived. And of course, uh, one of the most uh, obvious would be the impact of social isolation. Of course, that cannot be studied directly uh, in a human population, uh, for which reason we thought perhaps uh, we could focus on uh, Drosophila as a model system to ask about uh, 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 the nature of uh, responses, behavioral responses to social isolation. So uh, to begin with, let me just tell you a little bit about how we monitor sleep in flies. Uh, remarkably, uh, flies have uh, sleep-wake cycles, much like humans. Uh, we can monitor these uh, using uh, a, a simple computer system. Uh, single flies are placed in individual tubes that uh, carry a small amount of food, enough to uh, keep them alive for a week or so. And uh, these tubes are placed in a monitor uh, uh, that contains uh, an infrared beam that runs across the tubes and a uh, phototransistor that, uh, uh, that will uh, uh, monitor the shadowing of that light beam by a moving fly. And the results of the, the computer collection of information, an example is uh, rendered here where about 30 flies, the individual records over a 24 hour interval of about 30 uh, Drosophila are shown here stacked one on top of the other. And what we see is that in the morning, the fly, these are the, the dark blue areas are times when the fly is sleeping. Uh, and what you see is that the flies are active in the morning, they're active in the evening, and much of the time, much of their lives, they're sleeping a long midday siesta and consolidated sleep at night. So of course, this is similar uh, in many ways to uh, human behavior in many areas of the world. This is another way of uh, plotting that same uh, information. Again, the level of sleep goes up in the middle of the day. It's low, that is when the animals are active in the morning and evening. And again, the amount of sleep rises uh, through the night giving a consolidated period of rest. So we wanted to use this system to ask whether social isolation reduces sleep in Drosophila. Now we might not think at first that Drosophila are particularly social animals. Uh, we certainly didn't, we, there was, uh, we didn't have extensive data on this uh, in the beginning of our uh, studies, but uh, several studies have been published in the past that indicate that although they're not like bees or ants, they do show interactions with each other that suggest a fairly rich social environment and social behaviors. So our approach was to uh, 
to rear flies for three to five days uh, in a bottle uh, in, a, in a condition where many flies were together so that social experience could be acquired. And then to take flies from uh, such a bottle and move them into different vials containing different numbers of flies. One fly, two flies, five flies, 25 flies, or 100 flies, and keep them in that uh, situation for a period of seven days, for a week. And ask using our Drosophila activity monitoring system, whether there was an impact uh, on sleep uh, for any of these conditions. And what we find is that for most of these arrangements, there is no impact on the, uh, on the pattern of sleep, with the exception of flies that are by themselves. Isolated flies, one fly by itself, shows a strong diminution of sleep, during, particularly during the day, but also, as you'll see, uh, some diminution at night. But um, um, any combination of additional flies uh, eliminates uh, that response, even two flies uh, in a vial uh, eliminates uh, that, uh, that loss uh, of sleep during the experiment. So we also wanted to ask whether or not this uh, change in behavior, sleep, beha sleep wake behavior, was uh, 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 accumulated over time. That is, is it isolation duration dependent? Uh, to do that, we asked, we compared 25 flies uh, in one vial to a single vial in another and repeated this experiment either one day, three days, five days, or seven days to determine whether or not there was a, a change in uh, this pattern of sleep-wake activity uh, that reflected the duration of social isolation. And what we found was that uh, at one day, there's very little uh, change from baseline. Three days, uh, more or less the same result. At five days, we start losing sleep, particularly during the day. And by seven days, we have a fairly strong reduction uh, in sleep. So there is a, uh, a continuity uh, that uh, indicates that over time, the longer the fly uh, is isolated, the more severe the impact on sleep. Now, this is not just true uh, for the strain of Drosophila uh, melanogaster, the species Drosophila melanogaster that we uh, began with. We found that this is true of many isogenic strains, every isogenic strain that we've tested, and many different Drosophila species. We found no species of Drosophila that showed a different pattern. They all showed loss of sleep following social isolation that was duration dependent. We also looked at sleep inbred lines. These are lines that were recovered uh, from the field. So they are uh, truly wild flies. And they've been brought into the lab and then uh, subjected to pair matings and expansions. Uh, and when uh, you do something like that, you find that different isolates have different natural tendencies to sleep either more or less than many of our uh, laboratory reared flies. And uh, uh, what we found was it didn't matter whether they were long sleepers or short sleepers, all of them uh, changed their sleep pattern in this fashion uh, following social isolation. We also looked at young versus, young versus old flies and found that both uh, changed their uh, sleep-wake behavior in this fashion following social isolation. This is just a, a, a more quantitative way of showing what's happening and also breaks the response down to sleep uh, that, has, uh, that is being measured at different times of the day and night. So for example, you can see here that after that there's a progressive loss of sleep uh, in, the socially, in the isolated flies, which are in red versus the control flies in blue. Uh, and uh, if we look at total sleep, uh, we see some degradation. Uh, if we instead look at daytime sleep, we see a more severe degradation. And in particular, if we look at the uh, loss of sleep in that window that just precedes the mid midday nap, uh, we see a very substantial diminution uh, of sleep in that interval, uh, a diminution of a, a loss of about 40% of the expected sleep uh, following seven days of isolation in that interval that just precedes the, uh, the midday nap. 
We've also asked whether or not we can suppress this uh, uh, <clears throat> response by manipulating, further manipulating the environment uh, of, the, uh, of the flaw. So for example, uh, zero would indicate the baseline for flies that are kept uh, in a group rearing, a group reared situation. Uh, isolation, a single fly in a tube would give this 40% depression uh, in total sleep. We asked what would happen if we, uh, if we had a vial which had been inhabited by 20 flies for a week, remove those flies and then put in a single fly and followed it for a week. What happens to the, uh, does it have any impact on the uh, social isolation response? And it uh, apparently doesn't. It looks just like a fly that uh, had always been in, in social isolation in, a, in an unused vial. We asked if we put a, uh, a glass slide down the middle uh, of the vial uh, so that the flies could see each other with 25 flies on one side and a single fly on the other, would that have an impact? It doesn't. Uh, the fly uh, that's by itself still uh, produces these um, uh, solo responses. Uh, if we put a, uh, a filter in between the flies, 25 flies on one side, a single fly on the other, and have uh, a porous filter that uh, will allow uh, chemical uh, communication across both sides uh, of the vial, we find uh, that seems to uh, produce a, uh, 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 an impact. Uh, so those flies are able to see and uh, uh, now uh, chemically sense uh, their neighbors, and they seem to be even worse off than the fly that's isolated by itself. And a, a fly that can see, smell, and reach through uh, a material, uh, but can't join the other flies, also seems to be depressed even further with respect uh, to sleep duration during this uh, pre-nap uh, interval uh, of its sleep-wake cycle, suggesting that uh, these flies are suffering not just from being alone, but from a feeling of exclusion. They're not able to, uh, uh, to join the flies that, are, that they know are there on the other side of this separation. Uh, we can uh, alleviate this problem by uh, adding to a single uh, Drosophila melanogaster fly, 20 flies from another species, Drosophila simulans, so they don't all have to be the same uh, species. Uh, here we've uh, thought, well, what about a different uh, uh, type of insect altogether, a beetle, uh, ladybugs. We've uh, tried uh, uh, ladybugs from two different uh, sources, apparently uh, different genetics in their background. One relieved the problem, the other didn't, uh, which uh, bears further investigation. And putting another kind of insect, uh, another kind of beetle in altogether uh, had no impact. And finally, putting in some inanimate uh, objects uh, in the uh, in the vial seems to uh, produce a a more a vigorous negative uh, response. So we have a number of different manipulations that we can use to look at the impact of environment further beyond uh, social social isolation, which will be of uh, additional interest in the future. Now, since the greatest impact on uh, on sleep appears to occur just before the midday nap. Uh, we were very interested in knowing whether there were gene expression changes uh, in the brain that were associated with these behavioral changes. We assumed there might be. Uh, and uh, in order to pursue this, we thought we could uh, sample RNA derived from the heads of flies just before the mid morning nap uh, as likely to be a, a time when gene expression might be maximal uh, associated with changes to social isolation. <clears throat> so we did, we isolated RNA from heads at that uh, time point in socially enriched flies, in chronically associate, uh, isolated flies, flies isolated from seven days, and from flies that were acutely isolated, isolated for just a single day, which you'll remember were not distinguishable from socially enriched flies. And we compared the transcriptomes. We did uh, um, whole transcriptomics, uh, whole genome transcriptomics 
uh, on those uh, head samples and looked for uh, differences that were expressed in these three groups. What we found were 274 genes that differed in the uh, set that was from chronically isolated flies versus those from socially enriched flies and those from acute, acutely isolated uh, flies. Now, a further filter, uh, uh, we wanted to apply a further filter. What We were looking for things that didn't change much between the group reared flies and those isolated for a single day, acutely isolated, uh, because the behavioral differences, we, we saw no behavioral differences between those groups. So we were particularly interested in changes, either up or down expression changes in the chronically isolated flies from those two groups. Uh, uh, and uh, we found two blocks, which I'll call category two and category four, in which that occurred, where we have similar levels of expression uh, in the group, group and one day isolated flies and a lowered expression uh, in the chronically isolated flies or a raised expression uh, in the chronically isolated uh, flies. So this gave us 214 genes. And uh, what we were impressed with is when we did geo uh, analysis, that is what kinds of genes, what kinds of processes, physiological processes are being uh, manipulated uh, in response to social isolation. We found that most of them, the, the most abundant uh, categories were all metabolic processes. We're having a strong effect on metabolic activity across uh, the genome in response to social isolation. Now on the right here are shown uh, the top 20 responding genes that we uh, uh, identified. These are the top 20 changes in the chronically isolated flies versus the other two classes of flies. And uh, what you'll see are, are uh, uh, arrows over here on the right side uh, of this chart. Those arrows refer to uh, genes that were previously shown to be uh, strongly altered in their expression in response to 24 hours of starvation. So in general, the most extensive pattern that we're seeing is not only of metabolic genes, but particularly of genes that respond to starvation uh, in the fly. The brain is acting uh, in a fashion that is uh, quite similar to that of a starving fly. And I'll just point to a couple of genes. Lemostatin uh, is, a, is a protein hormone that is produced uh, uh, as an appetite stimulating hormone. So it's stimulated by hunger. Uh, drosoph drosophokinin, uh, which is strongly reduced uh, in this comparison, is a, is a, is a satiety signaling uh, hormone. So, uh, so these flies are not satisfied with the food they're getting, and they've got increased appetite just from looking at the lemostat and drosophokinin uh, responses that we're seeing. Uh, we, we wondered, given this strong response, uh, and we have a sleep deficit, and yet we're seeing changes that suggest alterations in metabolism and appetite. We wondered if this, uh, if chronic social isolation was producing a change in appetite. To do this, we uh, employed a video monitoring uh, approach, which involves a capillary uh, feeding assay. This is where a, a capillary that's filled with food is uh, inserted in the uh, tube housing the fly instead of solid food. So the fly can crawl up on the end of the capillary, drink from liquid food from the capillary. And by measuring changes in the meniscus of that capillary with a video recording, we can determine how much uh, food is being ingested over time. At the, at, uh, at the same, uh, in the same monitoring system, we can also follow the movements of the fly so that we can get correlated uh, locomotor activity uh, data and uh, food consumption data in one experiment. So up here are shown the sleep responses uh, in blue, group reared flies in red are socially, chronically socially isolated flies, seven day isolate flies. And what we see once again by this assay 
is a loss of sleep in the chronically isolated uh, flies. And what you see down here is the response, the feeding response to the uh, social isolation. Where in purple, the, the socially isolated flies are shown to be eating uh, far more than their uh, controls that have been uh, group reared. Uh, again, a quantitative uh, uh, view of, of what's happening. This, uh, these are all sleep records. Uh, this is total sleep, daytime sleep, nighttime sleep, and this ZT zero to four uh, hour sleep, which is again, the four hours just preceding the midday nap. And what you see is what we saw with the other kind of uh, monitoring. Again, uh, a drop in the amount of sleep in all of these categories, uh, certainly in the uh, prior to the midday map, nap. But now new data on uh, appetite when feeding, the amount of food ingested, uh, total food consumption, daytime, nighttime, and this early morning food consumption. What you see is at all of these time points, the flies are consuming more than twice what the control flies are consuming. Their, uh, uh, their appetite apparently is, uh, is driving them to, uh, uh, to much more abundant uh, consumption. And this is in, in spite of the fact that there is a similar, there's exactly the same availability of food for each of these groups uh, of flies. So appetite is strongly stimulated in these flies. Now this response is reminiscent to a, uh, a study recently published by the American Psychological Association that is focused on humans. And uh, this certainly surprised me when I saw the, uh, the data. This is a report over the same year long interval from March of uh, 2020 to March of 2021. This is the same interval that I showed uh, earlier for a University of College London sleep study. But this time we're looking at body weight changes. And uh, strikingly, uh, six in 10 uh, United, in the United States, six out of 10 adults have either gained or lost weight uh, over that period uh, of time. And uh, by far, the most common response is a gain of weight, a significant gain of weight. Uh, the, these weight gains in red uh, are found for, uh, to uh, be true for uh, many, many different classes of individuals. If we break this down into uh, uh, different populations, there's no population that seems to be immune from this uh, kind of a response. And on the weight gain side, the weight gains can be quite substantial, 40 pounds, 35 pounds, uh, 37 pounds. Uh, this is uh, uh, hard to imagine uh, pre-pandemic, uh, thinking about changes in body weight of this magnitude. So again, I think what we're seeing is we, we've got um, uh, a study uh, in Drosophila that is suggesting that a very similar kind of response is occurring uh, in the fly uh, in response to social isolation. So what we were especially interested in uh, is where this response is driven. How, where are the neural uh, circuits that are uh, controlling this response to it? to this uh, change in environment, this uh, response to social isolation. So I, again, uh, we focused on uh, uh, three of these genes, target of brain insulin, lemostatin, and drosophokinin, since those were abundantly altered in their uh, uh, expression. And also since we have background information, particularly on lemostatin and drosophokinin. So we asked, can we find uh, these proteins in the um, can we find neurons in the brain uh, that are responsible for producing uh, these uh, responses? And uh, lemostatin, we had antibodies to lemostatin, which was what we uh, wanted to first use to look for these responses in the fly brain. Uh, prior to this work, lemostatin was not known to be expressed in the brain. It had previously been found in something called the corpora alata, which is uh, resident in the thorax of the fly. But here we see that in the central brain, in a structure called a fan-shaped body, and in the dorsalmost uh, uh, projections in the fan-shaped body, we see strong uh, staining of lemostatin antibody uh, in that part of the structure, the fan-shaped body. This is a central brain. 
of the fly. And we know that this structure, the dorsal fan, the fan shaped body, is involved in many behavioral responses uh, in the fly. And so here we have uh, uh, a, um, a neuropeptide uh, stimulated by increased, associated with increased appetite that's abundantly produced uh, in this region, in this very fine group of cells in the dorsal region of this uh, structure in the central brain. Now, uh, we had recognized a tool from Drosophila that enables us to express uh, just about any uh, gene product we wish uh, uh, in the fly. Uh, this is uh, called a, uh, a driver, a gene driver, and uh, its acronym is P2GAL4. And when that is expressed uh, 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 in a fashion that uh, lets it turn on uh, a, a gene that encodes green fluorescent protein, we see a response that looks like this. So this is now green fluorescent protein responding in what I'll call the P2 cells driven by this tool that we have in Drosophila. And if we overlay these two images, the lemostatin image and the GFP, the green fluorescent protein image, we see a strong overlap of those two signals indicating that it is the P2 cells that are responsible for much, perhaps all of the uh, signal that we're uh, seeing from lenostatin in this part of the brain. Now, uh, this allowed us to, add, to use that tool to manipulate the activity of the, that neural circuit. What happens if we silence uh, the lenostatin producing neurons in that central brain region? Well, we can do that by using this uh, P2 neuron uh, controlling tool uh, to uh, produce, uh, uh, instead of GFP, uh, a, uh, a protein that encodes a defective potassium channel that's always open. It's called KIR 2.1. If we express KIR 2.1 uh, in uh, P2 neurons, that, that, uh, protein, that uh, potassium channel will inactivate uh, any cell in which it's expressed. It simply puts pores in the cell so that it can no longer be electrically active. So when we use the P2 tool to produce that uh, channel protein in the P2 neurons, we see now that that restores normal sleep uh, to flies that have been isolated for seven days. So we've eliminated the behavioral response, the sleep response, uh, by uh, silencing uh, those neurons. Now, our controls are the two parental stocks that were used that were put together uh, to uh, allow that, that uh, control to happen. And what you see is that the two control uh, stocks still show that deficit in sleep, which they should. So silencing the P2 neurons, silencing these lenostatin uh, producing neurons, will eliminate the sleep deficit produced by chronic social isolation. The same experiment, uh, now we, we're look, using that video assay to ask about uh, uh, food consumption. Is there, we've seen an effect on sleep, is there also an effect on food consumption? We see, yes, there's a very strong effect. This is where we've inactivated uh, uh, the, uh, the P2 cells. And what you see is a drop in food consumption to baseline to the level seen in the green controls, where in the control parental strains that did not produce that inactivation, we see the very high levels of uh, food consumption uh, that we saw uh, previously. So inactivating the P2 neurons, a small group of neurons, about 50 neurons in the central brain, uh, will eliminate this response to social isolation, both at the level of appetite and at the level of sleep. Now, we can turn this uh, question around. We can say, what happens if we artificially activate uh, these neurons? If we have not produced chronic social isolation, but activate these neurons, what kind of a response do we get? Now, we can perform this experiment by using, uh, again, the same uh, genetic tool, the P2-GAL4 tool. So this time, instead of producing 
uh, a channel, a potassium channel, which will inactivate uh, cells expressing it. We're going to express a cation channel called trip A1, which is heat sensitive. It's active at high temperatures at 28 degrees, and it's inactive at a lower temperature, 22 degrees. When it's active, the neurons are active. When it's uh, at lower temperature, when it's, when it's closed, those cells are not active. And what we've done, just if you just pay attention to the, uh, to the data on the right side, uh, shown in red here, uh, if we, if we uh, incubate either uh, group eared flies or flies isolated for a single day uh, at 22 degrees, we get no difference uh, in their uh, sleep response. If we, uh, however, uh, expose those uh, same flies to 28 degrees for a day uh, and uh, either group rear them or have them isolated for one day, we see a dramatic drop in the amount of sleep in those flies where the trip channel has now been activated. So activation will produce in a fly that's been only isolated for a single day, a response that's comparable to that of a wild type fly that's been chronically isolated for seven days. But there's no effect on flies that have been group reared. Uh, on the right, uh, now looking at uh, appetite, we see the same kind of response at 22 degrees when the channel that we're uh, producing uh, is closed. We don't see a difference between group reared flies and isolated flies. Uh, on the other hand, if we raise the temperature of the flies to 28 degrees and look at the group reared versus the single day isolation, we see a, a, a dramatic increase in the amount of food consumed in the flies that are carrying the now activated trip A1 channel. So activating these neurons will cause a change uh, in appetite uh, after a single day of isolation where we would not see this uh, in flies, in wild type flies that are isolated for a single day. So there's something about activation of these that will switch the system off. Now, uh, the other thing that's important to consider uh, in this work is uh, we're looking at both sleep and ap appetite. We've seen that the lemmastatin uh, neurons, those are clearly uh, uh, associated with appetite. So it's easy to understand how a change in appetite would come from either silencing or activating those neurons. But why are we uh, affecting sleep? Well, if we look at uh, a known group of sleep promoting neurons that are uh, recognized using uh, another genetic tool called R23E10. Uh, if we use R23E10 to label those sleep promoting neurons with green fluorescent protein, we see these uh, projections here are labeled. Now, if we compare that to the uh, cells that were labeled with lemmastatin, we see a very similar. Uh, arrangement. And in fact, if we merge these two images, we see that these two groups of cells are immediately uh, adjacent to each other in the uh, fan-shaped body. Now, further work that has uh, uh, recently been published, electron micrographs of all the neurons in the central brain and all the synaptic connections in the central brain of the fly uh, allows us to look at the individual interactions of these two groups of cells. And there are extensive synaptic uh, connections between these two groups of cells. So it seems very likely to us that activation of the lemmastatin producing uh, neurons will have an impact on the sleep promoting neurons and vice versa. So let me finish up by just drawing uh, a, a few uh, conclusions. Uh, first, uh, Drosophila can distinguish uh, acute from chronic social isolation. We feel that makes them a good model for studying in depth the neurological basis for these behavioral responses. Uh, chronic social isolation activates central brain neurons that regulate appetite, uh, as uh, I've shown you, particularly with uh, the appetite uh, stimulating uh, hormone uh, lemmastatin. Increased feeding or the starvation brain state that's induced by chronic isolation appears to broadly reset gene expression programs that are associated with metabolism. <clears throat> so this was not something that we 
at first expected as a primary response to uh, social isolation. Isolation uh, uh, nevertheless produces a strong uh, gene expression uh, change, uh, a broad genome-wide gene expression change that's associated with altered metabolic activities. This of course may in large part be due to the fact that appetite has increased in response to social isolation. Uh, food ingestion has increased and all of these of course may set in motion a very broad metabolic change. The drive to feed may indirectly uh, inhibit sleep. Uh, certainly you can't eat and sleep at the same time. Uh, nevertheless, as I uh, mentioned, the exonal pro projections of uh, previously documented sleep promoting neurons do have extensive synaptic connections with projections of P2 neurons, which makes us think that in the brain, uh, sleep and uh, appetite are intimately associated with one another as a behavioral response to social isolation. And then finally, the hyperactivity of P2 neurons uh, alters the duration of social isolation needed to reduce, uh, reduce sleep, uh, suggesting that P2 neurons somehow encode, encode uh, time-dependent uh, isolation status. There, something is ticking down uh, as we as we move into social as a fly moves into social isolation and uh, continues to be isolated day after day. There's a change in behavior, a change uh, that uh, that uh, increases these appetite and sleep defects. And uh, since we can shortchange that by toggling by activating these uh, P2, P2 neurons, we think the P2 neurons uh, may be importantly involved in that timing, uh, 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 event, those timing events that are going on in the fly. So let me close just by uh, uh, indicating the, the people that did this work. Uh, I just want to point out two individuals here, Wan He Li, who's now uh, just recently moved to uh, Texas A&M as an assistant professor. Uh, she drove uh, uh, this work uh, when she was a postdoc uh, in the laboratory. Uh, Zikun Wang, who is now at Regeneron, is the uh, here in New York is uh, is a graduate student who uh, was uh, who worked alongside Wan Ho Lee to uh, uh, produce this extensive data on the response of the fly to social isolation. So uh, I hope. Uh, I hope in the future we'll be able to tell you more about what's going on in mammals. Uh, as I said uh, originally, our, our interest in using Drosophila is that uh, these were experiments that would be very difficult uh, to use in a discovery phase uh, in mammals. But once uh, we have some ground rules uh, established, we can certainly ask whether there are correlates in uh, even more complicated systems. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Really a very interesting preclinical trial, and I think it's a fascinating study. And yes, we are looking forward to have you here in Monterey in the near future, so the invitation is, it's, it's of course, open. I have some questions from the virtual audience, but of course, in the meantime, if people from the audience have a question, just raise the hands and a microphone will be handed to you. The first question, Michael, perhaps you mentioned it, but uh, uh, we didn't catch it quite well. It's, how do you know that a fly is sleeping? Uh, a very important uh, question. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about this, but uh, there has, uh, there's been a, a period of about uh, 10 years over which uh, studies of Drosophila sleep uh, have ensued. Uh, we can't do EEGs in flies, but we can do something called local field potential measurements. <clears throat> and those vary uh, significantly when a fly is simply transiently resting, uh, if it pauses for a few minutes at times of day when we think the fly should be uh, awake and, and moving around. Those local field potentials are very different from those that are seen uh, when the fly is resting 
uh, at times of uh, day or night when we uh, believe sleep is occurring. Flies uh, show uh, responses to uh, arousal uh, uh, mediating uh, drugs such as modafinil and caffeine, for example, in the same way we would be uh, made more alert by those uh, drugs. They show consolidated patterns of sleep and activity that are also uh, reflective of circadian uh, rhythms uh, like uh, mammalian uh, sleep-wake uh, patterns. And uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the collection of uh, much data around those kinds of areas have uh, suggested that the flies, uh, when they are resting, are uh, producing an act that uh, resembles sleep. And once again, even from the, the current studies, uh, we see that uh, 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 social isolation is certainly, uh, it's certainly uh, apparent that social isolation has an impact on sleep uh, in humans. And uh, now we're seeing a, a fairly strong impact on sleep uh, in the fly. So the more, the more kinds of experiments we do, uh, the more convinced we, uh, we become, that there is a form, there, there are relationships between this pattern of uh, activity and inactivity that we see uh, in the fly that really can be compared in many ways to sleep. Thank you very much. And the second question perhaps is related. Why to use flies for this experiment and not other uh, insects like ants? Is that because there is a comparison with the human characteristic and behavior? with uh, Drosophila is there are so many genetic tools that we can incorporate in doing our studies. Uh, ants, I have a colleague, uh, Daniel Cronauer at Rockefeller, who's doing a spectacular job uh, producing new tools to do studies uh, of many kinds of behaviors in ants. And I suspect we'll be collaborating in the future uh, on eusocial uh, uh, insects of that sort, but there's such a long history of genetic tool building uh, in Drosophila that uh, it becomes, uh, it's still, I think, the ideal place to begin these kinds of experiments. And uh, I'll, point, I'll just point out another uh, example, and that is with our, our uh, uh, many years of work on uh, circadian rhythms and on the circadian clock, which of course, uh, what opened that mystery, the mysteries of circadian rhythms up was a genetic approach that occurred for the first time in Drosophila in the 1970s by Seymour Benzer and Ron Kanapka, a student in Seymour Benzer's lab at Caltech. And it was, and they chose uh, Drosophila simply because of the uh, ease of genetic manipulation. They found the first mutations that affected uh, circadian rhythmicity. Uh, and that work was expanded on uh, by us and by uh, particularly Michael Rossbash and Jeff Hall as well, uh, that led to um, a, a, a fairly deep understanding of the molecular mechanisms underlying circadian rhythms in the fly that became uh, uh, of great relevance to our own circadian rhythms. Today, we see that the same genes that we found uh, in the fly, uh, we find naturally occurring polymorphisms in human populations that are associated with sleep disorders. So uh, there's uh, uh, it's not such a big step to go from uh, the fly to mammals uh, in circadian rhythms, and we uh, and we're optimistic that the same can be uh, will prove to be the case uh, in many other areas of biology. Thank you, Michael. And perhaps this third question is kind of anticipating your your answer to the previous one. And it's related with this relationship on sleep gene pattern can be translated to human through comparative genomics, or it's necessary to generate a transcriptome analysis in human. No, you can do analysis in humans quite effectively. For example, we, we performed one study of a, uh, of a syndrome, a sleep uh, disorder called delayed sleep phase disorder, 
uh, in humans. This started out as a collaboration with a group at Weill Cornell uh, Medical School in which we, uh, uh, we examined the number of uh, small families that uh, appeared to have a hereditary form of a sleep disorder. And uh, I'll, for lack of a better way of describing it, uh, they behave like night owls. They have a very difficult time uh, falling asleep at night and they have a very difficult time getting up in the morning. And as a result, they go to bed late and they get up uh, late. They get just as much sleep as everybody else, but they're shifted. As it, it's as if they're on a constant jet lag uh, pattern. So we, uh, we investigated that family, we looked at their uh, total genome sequence, sequences, and we found that members of that family uh, that showed this behavior had a change in one of the circadian rhythm genes that uh, had been uh, previously uh, identified in animal models, uh, cryptochrome found in both flies and humans. And uh, uh, that mutation, uh, we then found in a collaboration with uh, a group in Turkey, uh, could be found in many, many families uh, in a Turkish uh, study uh, where the behavior uh, could be uh, assessed of those individuals. And starting then from a polymorphism first uh, approach, we found that carriers of that polymorphism had significantly different patterns of sleep from family members that did not carry that polymorphism. So we're able to move pretty smoothly between information obtained from a, from a Drosophila model uh, into a mouse model, into uh, human uh, studies of, uh, of uh, disorder. One of the, the, the uh, things I've been impressed with most about the human study is that uh, the human study revealed that the nature of the change uh, in the gene, this polymorphism causes a shorter protein, which is missing a part of its uh, C-terminal region. And uh, follow-up studies have revealed that that region of the protein acts as an autoregulator to, uh, to suppress the activity of uh, uh, the cryptochrome one protein, which is a transcription transcription factor. Uh, my point is that we learned something new about the fundamental biology of the way that uh, protein works by studying humans. Uh, so we can leapfrog back and forth between uh, uh, animal model studies and now human studies. And finally, I'll just point out that we now have hundreds of thousands of whole genome data uh, in human databases. So uh, essentially every heritable uh, sleep disorder that we can think of must be buried in that database. And so uh, the question uh, becomes, can we use model, uh, model organisms or cell culture models uh, to determine which of those uh, polymorphisms are impactful with regard to uh, sleep disorders that, uh, that now appear to be uh, troubling human populations. Thank you very much, Michael. I will now invite the audience if there is any question. In the meantime, Michael, I would like to share with you some numbers and there is more than 250 virtual uh, people participating and here more than 160 present. We have a question of, over there. Yes, please do. Professor, firstly, um... Thank you for the, for the talk, it was very interesting. And I was wondering what is your hypothesis as to the evolutionary reason for the connection, the brain connection of the uh, sleep circuits and the uh, increased feeding circuits. And why would it be beneficial for an individual that is isolated to eat more? Thanks for that. I think this is, this, this is something that interests me as well. Uh, we, of course, don't know the answer, but I can speculate. Uh, you know, this, this whole response seems hardwired. That is, these circuits just start firing when the animal is, uh, is isolated, and they apparently intensify their firing over time as isolation becomes chronic. So uh, what I think 
uh, may be going on is deep in evolutionary history, uh, organisms that are used to being around others like themselves that are used to having social or, uh, uh, interactions, if everyone's gone, if they're by themselves all of a sudden, something bad has happened, uh, I imagine. Uh, this could be a, a dramatic change in the environment of some sort that has caused uh, all your, uh, all your uh, associates to be missing. So under conditions like that, it's conceivable that uh, the animal takes uh, uh, cover in the sense that uh, reducing sleep in order to eat uh, to stock up on, on uh, nutrients, to hunker down in case of a, uh, of a, uh, a fu future more uh, severe change in the environment uh, uh, is upon uh, the organism. So uh, it may be an early warning that something's very wrong. And one of the few things an animal can do is to increase its food intake in preparation for, uh, for uh, whatever may uh, come. Uh, due to these, uh, due to changes that have produced social isolation. Thank you, Michael. We do have another question from the audience, please. Uh, hi, Professor, it's a pleasure. I have a question. My name is Ana Paula. Uh, when you study the amount of sleep in a sample of a group, do you monitor them as a group? Do you take uh, one as a sample and measure that one? Or uh, do you, the computer monitor each one and then Pounder and average. Right. This is this is an important issue too, uh, and and it points to something uh, that I think is is very interesting, which means that these effects of how the fly is reared uh, have after effects, because what we do when we measure locomotor, uh, I mean when we measure uh, uh, sleep or appetite is we're measuring that in individual flies. So the individual fly has come from a group or it's come from a condition of social isolation. But of course it's isolated during the time <clears throat> that we're monitoring it. So I think what may be happening is that for the group reared flies, they're only being isolated for a day as we're, uh, as we're assessing uh, their uh, uh, behaviors. And as we've seen acute social isolation, uh, will only produce an impact if we've artificially activated the neural circuit that I talked about. But uh, you're correct, we do in both cases, uh, look at single the behavior of single flies, uh, either those that have been raised as part of a group or those that have been reared alone. Thank you, Michael. We do have a lot of questions from the virtual audience, but perhaps in the interest of time, I will allow another question from the from the audience here at the, up the room, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Young, for your presentation. I have two uh, questions. The first one is, um, many of these experiments reminded me of an isolation experiment. Uh, it first started, I believe, with a single French guy in a cave that went for four days, and I think uh, at least he, his, his perception of time was quite altered. I think now they are doing it with a lot more people like up to a month of isolation and things like that. Do you, uh, have you read about these experiments and wondered if their feeding behaviors have been reported also to be altered? And the second question is, uh, if you could comment uh, or give your opinion about introducing the use of Drosophila as a model for teaching basic genomics and genetics in undergraduate biosciences and life sciences programs. Thank you. The second question first, yeah, I, you know, as a uh, as a student, uh, when I was an undergraduate in college, I certainly was exposed to uh, experimental biology uh, using Drosophila. Uh, it's an easy organism for uh, a uh, a teaching laboratory to obtain. Uh, they're easy to maintain. It, they're inexpensive. And uh, you can learn a great deal about just fundamental principles of genetics by uh, doing with your own hands a, a, a few experiments that I used to bring home uh, vials of Drosophila to my kids when they were in elementary school. And I would let them make flies with uh, curly wings or uh, red eyes versus white eyes, things of that sort. They learned a lot of genetics by uh, 
uh, just curiosity and having the wherewithal to do some simple experiments. So I think it's uh, uh, even earlier uh, in education, uh, something like Drosophila, or Drosophila in particular is a, a very good teaching uh, tool. Now, with regard to the first question, the, the uh, isolation experiments, the bunker experiments that, uh, among others, Jürgen uh, 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 Eschoff had uh, uh, run many, many years ago. Uh, these were uh, primarily uh, organized around tests for circadian rhythmicity to determine whether or not uh, humans would continue to display uh, rhythmic behavior, rhythmic sleep-wake cycles, even when pulled out of the uh, of a, a light, dark, uh, a, a natural environment. And indeed, they did. But what uh, was found is that the period length well, uh, was altered in, uh, in many of those experiments uh, so that uh, uh, the exposure to light dark cycles, of course, will keep us on a 24 hour and a, a precisely 24 hour uh, rhythmicity periodicity. Whereas in a cave experiment, uh, uh, many of which went on for weeks, uh, there's a slow drift from what the rest of the outside world is, is doing. Now, what you brought up is, do we have information about changes in appetite uh, and changes uh, in sleep pattern that might be connected to social isolation? And that's a terrific question that I don't think was ever addressed uh, in those studies, but certainly uh, uh, similar sorts of studies could, could uh, be done uh, to directly uh, uh, monitor those kinds of responses as well. Uh, so it's a great suggestion. Michael, once again, thank you very much for a very interesting talk and, and also for sharing your, your time with us. So again, the invitation is open, so thank you very much. Voy a cambiar a español para invitarlos a seguir participando en las actividades del Congreso. Les recuerdo, a las 12 es la entrega del premio Rómulo Garza y a las 4, 4, 10, la participación en el panel de institutos. Otra vez, muchas gracias. Vamos a un receso. <risa>